It was about eight o'clock on a scorching hot Saturday afternoon in July when John Lewis, the carpenter, laid down his hammer and drew a few coppers from his pocket. Just the price of a pint! Resolving, therefore, to step across to the Golden Eagle and have some ale to allay his thirst. Just as he opened the door which led to the bar, what should he see on the polished counter but a plate of beautiful ripe cherries, the sight of which made John's mouth water so freely that ere he knew exactly what he was doing, his hand was stretched out to take a few, when the shrill voice of the landlady from behind called out, "'You touch them if you dare, sir!' John was startled, but before he could reply, the landlady added, "'The idea of your taking such a liberty! "'I should like to know what you're thinking about.' "'Well, missus, I was only going to take one or two to wet me whistle. "'You'd better not try it on,' she said with warmth. "'Why, you, you won't mind me having a few. "'I was so thirsty and they looked so tempting,' said John, "'thinking she was joking. "'No, sir, not one. "'I've just bought them as a treat for my children. "'They are a peculiar sort and very expensive. "'Well, just let me try one. "'No,' she answered with determination in every look. "'Not one. "'If you want any, buy your own cherries.' Well, replied John, I was going to have a pint of your best. But I think I'll take your advice and go and buy some cherries instead. And turning round, he walked out of the shop. The landlady saw in a moment that she had committed a mistake and called loudly for John to come back. But this only made him quicken his steps and get away as fast as possible. Well, I've done it, she said, as taking up her plate of cherries, she passed into the bar parlour. What a stupid I was not to let them have one or two. He's too good a customer to lose. I must look out, however, when he comes to pay his score and coax him. He must be won over again, if possible. And with such reflections, she tried to calm down her disturbed feelings. Meantime, John hastened down the street, looking out for the first shop where fruit was displayed. And as soon as he caught sight of the things he wanted, he called out, here, master, let me have threepence worth of those uh, cherries, will you? Yes, sir, said the man, and quickly placed in his hands a small bag containing the cherries. When John received them, he returned again to his workshop. All this had taken place in a few minutes, and the events had crowded so quickly one upon the other that when he laid the bag of cherries on the bench and put one in his mouth, its sweetness aroused vividly within him the treatment of the landlady, even with additional force, and her words seemed to stick in his throat, that as he swallowed the juicy fruit, each seemed to give birth to the landlady's words, Buy your own cherries. Yes, said John, and this is the way you serve a fellow, is it? After spending many a pound with you, and now to begrudge even a paltry cherry. And striking his hammer on the nail, as he muttered the words, its echo seemed to answer back to him, Yes, buy your own cherries. All the rest of that afternoon the words haunted him, and do what he would, even the saw and plane echoed the same advice, and at times he appeared to grow desperate, and from his lips would rush the words, Buy your own cherries. Ah, yes, said he, his wounded conscience calling him. I bought them too long for her and her children. I will take care of number one for the future and soon can have not only cherries but many other sweet things besides. At length, the bell rang for leaving off work and John walked to the counting house and received his wages, which amounted generally to about 30 shillings. For although he was in the habit of paying frequent visits to the public house, yet he was not by any means what the people would call a drunkard. Indeed, he would have felt insulted if anyone had dared to apply such a term to him. 
and no doubt would have been prepared in his way to prove that he only took what he considered did him good. And if he did on a Saturday night sometimes get over the score, if the friendly glass went round more freely than usual and the cheerful song caused the time to fly fast so that he went home later than usual, it was simply because he was a good fellow and must do as others do. But if, at such times, his wife complained that the money left was barely sufficient to purchase the needful things for the coming week, he was apt to tell her to mind your own business, and a few sharp words between them would be the result. But alas, such scenes are too well known to need description, and Mary, like many others, had grown weary with complaining. But nevertheless, she determined to do her best to keep the house as comfortable as her limited means would allow, and by kind words and looks, to make the home as attractive as possible, feeling assured that by such means she would more likely to draw him from the public house. The opposite course would most likely drive and keep him there. However, our friend John is standing at yonder gate with his wages in his hand, evidently hesitating what he shall do. Let us draw near, and by doing so, we shall hear what he has to say. Well, what shall I do? I must go and pay my score. I don't wish to be dishonest. If I knew how much it was, I would send it, but never mind. I'll go and pay her and have done with her. The moment the landlady caught sight of John, she put on her best smiles and without giving him time to utter a word said, I'm so glad to see you, John. We've just tapped a fresh barrel of our best. So drawing a glass and holding it to him, she said, I wish your opinion of it. No, thank you. I don't wish any, said John. I want to pay what I owe you. How much is it? Come, said Mrs Boniface, it's all stuff. Like, take a glass, man. You mean, what's your hurry? No, not a drop, said John. I want to be off. Well, will you have a glass of something short, said the landlady. Tom Smith's in the parlour and Dick Bates will be here directly. You won't go just yet. Well, you let me know how much I owe you, said John, getting impatient or I shall go without settling. I see now, said the landlady, that I've put my foot in it this afternoon and offended you, but I hope you won't mind a few words spoken in haste. So come on, let's be friends once more. Not a dram will I take here or anywhere else if I know it, said John, and as to offending me, that don't matter that I see, as long as you get your money. But, said the landlady while she was looking after the P's and Q's, pints and quarts. I don't like to quarrel with anyone, especially with you. Now do let us make it up, and as for the cherries, I've kept them for you. See, here they are, look. No, thank you, said John with a smile. I took your advice and went and bought some, which were delicious, and they take what I owe you out of this sovereign and I'll be off. I don't like, said the landlady, really, to, to change this without your tasting something. What will you take? Throwing a spat to catch a mackerel, by the by. Nothing, I say again, said John, speaking impatiently, and taking up his change, he walked out and soon found his way home. Well, I've made a nice mess of it this time, thought the landlady, and if I ever get caught losing my temper... I'll be bound it shall not be over such a good customer. If it had been one of those noisy fellows, I shouldn't have cared a bit, but a nice quiet fellow like John, who takes his glass so regularly and pays up every week. However, I'll look out, and the first chance I get to set him going again, I will. He's not going to slip in this way, I can assure him. He's too good to lose without an effort. And when once again I have him right... I'll keep him, I warrant. While she was thus scheming, John's future capture, he was hurrying home, 
and he reached it, much to the surprise of his wife, long before his usual time. She, however, had only to put the kettle on, and while preparing the tea things, the water boiled. John sat almost in silence and took his tea. Mary was on the point of asking him how it was that he was home so soon, when all at once he put his hand in his pocket and, taking out some money, threw it in her lap, saying, "'I suppose you'll be going to market soon, Mary?' "'Yes,' said Mary. And she would have added, "'And I should be glad to go soon.' But she had learnt by past experience that she must not say too much on a Saturday night. So, taking up the money, she went into the bedroom to get her bonnet and shawl, and, looking to see how much she had given her, was surprised to find some three or four shillings more than she usually received. "'I wonder whether he knows how much he's given me,' said Mary. But afraid, if she returned to ask, he want, want it back, uh, she quickly passed downstairs and out into the street, fearing every moment he would be after her for the extra shillings. When she returned laden from market, she found, from what the children told her, that father had been out almost all the time, and feared lest, after all, he had gone in search of her. However, when he came in soon after, nothing was said on either side, and thus the night was ended. It is strange how the drink chills the intercourse between man and wife, is it not? Sunday was spent in John's usual manner. In the morning he went for a walk and after dinner stayed at home to read the paper. When the shades of evening gathered around he strolled out and did not return until after ten o'clock. How many thus waste God's holy day through the cursed drink? This being a regular thing with him no notice was taken of it. Yet Mary thought John quiet and dull and once asked him kindly whether he was well. But he said he was all right, so she did not venture to question him again. All the next week passed off at home without any perceptible change, but John, not liking to return home sooner than usual, went on the Monday night to a temperance meeting, and was so much interested that when another meeting was announced to be held not far from there the next evening, he decided to go, and from what the speakers said of the good it had done them, he signed the pledge. On the Saturday, when the bell rung and John went to the office for his wages, he felt a thrill of joy run through him, and after receiving them retired to a quiet corner of the workshop, and looking at the sovereign and a half which lay in his hand, said, It's many a long day since I should see that ye both belong to me. And now I have got ye, I'll take good care I don't part with ye, unless I get plenty out of ye. And clasping his hand and putting it and its contents into his pocket, you might have heard him say, I'll buy my own cherries, that I will. Mary was much pleased to see him return even sooner than the week before, and soon placed the tea before him, and while bustling about the room, and doing her best to keep the children quiet, she felt almost inclined to say how pleased she was, but checked herself, lest he might, when giving her the money, stop some for the last week's mistake. When he had nearly finished his meal, he said, Here, Mary, you'll be wanting to go a marketing directly, I suppose. There's the money, throwing it into her lap. Her heart was ready to sink when she felt the money fall in her hand. Ah, she thought, he has soon stopped the overplus of last week. But, thinking by the light of the fire it looks rather yellow, she went to the window, for it was a narrow court in which they lived where the daylight never fairly entered the room except by accident, or when a streak of sunlight shot its ray down among them. Can it be possible, she thought, a sovereign and a half, and an utterance of surprise escape from her? It's... All this for me, John? Yep, yeah, said John, and I hope you'll spend it well. I hope, said Mary, trembling, you haven't done anything wrong to get it, John. 
No, my lass, said John, while his heart trembled with emotion. I have done wrong long enough, and I'm going to do right for the future. But, said Mary, never mind now, said John. Get your bonnet and shawl, and let us both go to market. Mary did not need a second order to get ready, all the while wondering how it was to be accounted for. Resolving, however, while she was tying her strings, that she would quietly wait until John thought proper to give her an explanation. And after bidding Mary and Tommy take care of the other children in the house, they went on their way. John then briefly told her the decision he had come to, hope she would forgive him for the past and help him to do better in the time to come, to all of which Mary listened with trembling yet joyful interest. Their conversation was soon interrupted by their approaching the first place that they should call at, which was the butcher's, who, when he saw them coming together, ceased crying, What will you buy? For, thought he, they won't want much. A small joint that everybody else leaves for some pieces in yonder corner at fourpence a pound. So he continued, looking at his stock of meat, with his back towards John and Mary. He was aroused from his reverie by hearing John's voice. I say, Governor, what's this uh, leg of mutton a pound? And looking round, he saw John in the act of handling a piece of meat of that description. The idea of your asking such a question, thought the butcher. But in a moment he said, Tenpence. Take it down and see what it weighs, said John. Yes, said the butcher thinking to himself, I'll weigh it, and that will settle you, I know. It weighs just eight pounds, and it comes to six shillings and eight pence. Now you're done, he thinks. I'll have it, says John. Yes, thinks the butcher, when you've paid for it. Here, Mary, said John, give him the money. And Mary pushed her finger inside her old glove, brought out the sovereign, and laid it on the butcher's block, so carefully as if she was afraid of rubbing the gold dust off. The butcher watched every movement and thought that all this care was to be regarded as a sign of deception and that the money was bad. So, taking it up quickly, he bounced it hard upon the block to test its quality. But when its ring assured him it was all right, in a moment his face changed its expression and his voice its tone, while he said in great politeness, uh, Can I send it home for you, sir? And is there any other article, beef, pork, etc.? While the change rested between his fingers. No, said John, feeling rather vexed. Nothing else tonight. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, let me see, you live at number 20 Broad Street, don't you? Yes, said John. And Mary, taking up the change, passed on from the shop. It's not necessary for us to follow them round to the other places. It's only right to say that each shopkeeper was surprised and pleased to receive larger orders and more money and, as a matter of course, showed an extra amount of politeness. Meanwhile, the children at home had their talk about the matter. How funny, said Tommy. To see father and mother go out to market together. Yes, said Mary, isn't it? I wonder, said Tommy, whether anybody that father knows has died and left him some money. And with similar childlike talk, they were engaged when a sharp rap at the door disturbed them. Mary went to the door and there stood a butcher boy with a basket and a leg of mutton in it. Does Mr Lewis live here? asked the boy. No, said Mary, there's no one of that name lives here. It's strange, said the boy. I was told this was the house. Isn't this number 20? Yes, said Mary, this is number 20, but no one of that name lives here. Well, who does live here? asked the boy. My father and mother and me, said Mary. And what's your father's name? asked the boy. They call him Jack Lewis, said Mary. Well, that's the same man. Mr and Jack's all the same, said the boy, and, and here's a leg of mutton for him. 
Oh, I'm sure you're wrong, said Mary. We never have such things as, as them come to our house. But I tell you it's all right, said the boy, and it's paid for. Well, if it's paid for, I'll take it in. But I'm sure you'll have to come and fetch it back again, said Mary. Oh, it'll be all right, said the boy, and away he went. My word, said Tommy, isn't it a whopper? Only fancy if it was on. Wouldn't we have a tuck in for dinner? And the little fellow danced about the room for joy. And while he was cutting his capers, not for the mutton sauce, in this manner, another knock was heard at the door. Here he comes, said Tommy. But on opening the door, a baker's boy presented himself with three loaves. Does Mr Lewis live here? asked the boy. Well, said Mary, thinking it strange, my father's called Jack Lewis, if it's him. All right, here's his loaves for him. Are they paid for? asked Mary. Yes, said the boy. Come, make haste. Well, I'll take them in, being as how they're all paid for, but we never have such big loaves as them, and I'm sure you'll have to fetch them back again, and there's, there's a mistake somewhere. There, that's all fudge said the boy, and off he went. My word, said Tommy, ain't them busters. See, sisters, they are new and well-baked too, ain't they? Only fancy if they was ours. Wouldn't we make an impression on them soon? And again he started off with a dance and a shout, in the midst of which another rap at the door was heard. Here they are, he said. I'll bring them to the door. But upon the door being opened, there was a lad with parcels of tea, sugar, coffee, etc. And the same question was asked. But Mary, by this time, had decided to take in all that was paid for, at the same time telling each one, they mustn't be surprised if they have to fetch them back again. The greengrocer sent potatoes and cabbages, the butter man, eggs, bacon and a few other articles from different shops arrived until the table began to be quite full. I do wish father and mother would come home, said Mary. Suppose a policeman was to come and find all these things here. What could we do? I wonder, said Tommy, whether father's going to keep a shop. Don't be silly, Tommy. It would make you still, I know, if we were all to go to prison, said Mary. In the midst of this dialogue, much to the joy of the children, father and mother returned and soon told them that the things on the table were for the coming week and that all of them would have a share if they were good and, giving them a piece each of the new loaf and a bit of cheese, off they were sent to bed and told to be very quiet. But quietness was out of the question. No sooner were they upstairs than they began to talk of the morrow's feasting and their tongues made such a noise that it woke the other children. And then Tommy had to tell them that downstairs there was such a whopping leg of mutton and such big loaves and lots of other things and they soon set up a shout which brought the mother to the foot of the stairs and she said... If you children don't be quiet, you shan't have any pudding tomorrow. Puddin? Puddin? said the little ones. What's that? And again the voice of Tommy was heard telling the others that downstairs there was flour and currants and that on the morrow Mother had promised to make them a plum pudding. Of course, with this additional piece of news, was it any wonder that their eyes were not much troubled with sleepiness and that long before the time for getting up had arrived, Tommy was showing them, by the aid of the pillows, how Mother would make the pudding, and how they wished for the time to arrive when they might be able to experience in reality that the proof of the pudding was in the eating. However, the day was at length fairly ushered in, and to the astonishing eyes of the children the whole of the articles displayed. And it is more easily to be imagined than described how the day passed, with so much to talk about and so many things to enjoy. And when, in the afternoon, while all were seated around the table, Mother brought out a plate of nice rosy ripe cherries, was it any wonder 
that when the children set up a shout of joy, Mary's heart was too full to contain its emotions. And while the children were making earrings out of the cherries, she drew close to John and kissing him quietly, the tears trickling down her cheeks, the meanwhile she whispered in his ear, We may be happy yet. And so it was. For in a short time, John found that he could buy clothes for his children and then for himself and wife. And somehow it began to be whispered that he was getting proud, for he moved into a better neighbourhood, where he had to pay about the same rent nevertheless. And soon after, he began to put by his savings in the building society, and this enabled him to build a house for himself. Meantime, the master, finding him more than ever attentive to his work, appointed him as foreman at an advanced rate of wages, and somehow John used to say that he found it vastly more pleasant to receive two pound ten shillings a week for looking after men doing the work than eighty shillings for doing it. And step by step he rose until he became a master himself, and instead of working, he had men to look after it and do it for him. His son Tommy is now practising as a physician with a good connection. He himself has built a nice row of houses from which he can receive sufficient to keep him without work the remainder of his days. And the rest of the children are being well educated with all the modern advantages of music, etc. And added to all this, he and his wife are, by the blessing of God, become consistent members of a Christian church and, as far as practicable, hearty supporters of the Grand Alliance and the Temperance Cause. Working men, the moral is soon told. It's not how much money a week you earn, but what you do with it when you get it. How many a home comfort, in the shape of carpets, sofas, chairs, books, etc., is lost by the simple fact that the money goes in the wrong way. If you learn nothing else by the sketch, you may learn this, that if you would have a home sweet home, you must buy your own cherries. <laughs>